for a while, I was privileged to be the director of Kenya Wildlife, the founder and director of KWS. And I used to attend international meetings, and particularly meetings with people from the southern part of Africa. And they would, well, we had a terrible problem at the time with elephant poaching. And they would say, you know, we're keeping our parks in South Africa pristine. And pristine is a word that's used a lot in English. And it says and it's an original state. And I'd look at these people and say, when does origin start? Your parks, the land on which you put the park has been there for millions of years. You people have been looking after this piece of land for a hundred years. Now, is that pristine? Or are you looking after something that's much older than that? And then I would look at our own parks, and I'd look at Amboseli or look at Sava, and you'd think, how do we keep these parks with enough vegetation and enough water to be there forever? And the answer is, well, you can, you can do what I did with my team, and that stop the poaching, uh, you can you can do that, but then people are doing other things outside, and and people put dams on rivers. Uh, people want irrigation. Uh, people want uh, to run farms with a lot of cattle. Uh, your park has a lot of lion, or a lot of this, or a lot of that. And there was a, a, an enormous incompati incompatibility between trying to conserve what's within with human activity outside. And so you think, well, we can start big programs for education, we can revenue share, we can tell the local people, yeah, you get half, we get half, but please don't dam the river, uh, please understand it if our Simba eats your cattle sometimes, or our elephants eat your bananas, but let's just try to keep the balance. Well, so, so. But then, climate change comes along, and suddenly these rivers that you want to share there's no more water. So the people on the outside have to get a little to survive. But they're not going to let the rest of it waste in the park where animals drink it. And so the, the difficulty of conservation with external as well as internal uh, pressures was huge. And so I started to think more about uh, what I had learned from prehistory, looking at animal populations that are now extinct that lived in parts where I'd worked in Kenya that were millions of years old and many became extinct. Now the reason animals became extinct in the past was never because of us. We weren't here. But it was because of the environment changing. And when there was less rainfall for long periods of time Lakes disappeared, rivers stopped running, certain plants stopped growing, humidity changed, deserts came in, and you lost hundreds of species to extinction because of climate change. And so I thought more and more about this and realized that uh, in the long term, conservation with the idea of maintaining it forever is nonsense. You can't do that. But what you can do is, is slow down the process of extinction. You can minimize the rapid loss, but you can't do everything. Now, many years ago, and I was I, I told you in the break, I, I, in 1991, 92, I gave a talk at a very important scientific society in, in America, in Washington. And I said then, my prediction in 1992 was that by the end of the century, that is 2000, maybe a little later, the world will have lost 50% of the species. 50% on the land, 50% in the water, 50% in the forest. Now, as it happens, people like David Attenborough and some of the great internationally known scientists are now saying, good gracious, this is terrifying. We've lost more than 50%. We knew that in 1992. I said it. Many people said it. But humans seem unable to put themselves in a position where there is no future. There is a future of a kind. 
So I think if we focus now on minimizing the impact of climate change, and we focus now on the conservation of species within our own boundaries. But you know, you don't have to have hungry people eating rats in Pumwani. You don't have to have hungry people eating monkeys in Kakamega. We should, as a government, as a people, be able to look after our people so that we at least stop encroaching on other species. Uh, we don't have to, to worry, we shouldn't be worrying too much about solar power from, from, from the ocean for water. We should stop wasting water. How many people wash their cars every day? You only wash your car. The car doesn't smell. Um, you know, we're just not sensible about our use of resources. And I hope that people listening to this would realize that, you know, when you, when you throw tucker tucker out of the window, the children coming back from school, poor things, they're not there yet, but they'll go back, um, and you throw rubbish into the water stream, and, and you throw oil, it's not helping you. And it's killing hundreds of other creatures in the process. And so I think we've got to be a little more um, hygienic in the way we live in our world. And we've got to care for others. And of course, everybody can't have three meals a day. But they've got to have enough meals that they don't have to eat rats and lizards and, and, and creatures that probably got all sorts of diseases. And, you know, we think that corona is terrible. and has killed, what, nearly 100 million people around the world. And it came from a pangolin. And a pangolin is a creature that lives in Africa, and people started eating them. Now, all of these wild creatures, whether they're ours, or whether they're in Asia, or whether they're in South America, they all carry their own uh, bugs and, 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 and um, viruses. And if you start eating them, and you don't know what you're eating, the chances are they'll jump to humans. And although I'm no doubt that in the next year we will control corona, there's about a hundred other viruses waiting to, to attack us. So we've got to be much more realistic about how we treat other creatures, other species, the environment, everything.